Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your kindness to us. Thank you, Father, that you don't change. That we can trust that you will always be good. You'll always be kind. You'll always extend mercy. We are so grateful for who you are. And as we come tonight to sit at your feet, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us. Teach us what you want us to know. Open our eyes and let us see with clarity the things that you would have us to see. We give you permission to convict us, to challenge us, to encourage us, to train us, to equip us, to do whatever it is that you have intended to do tonight. And I just ask you, Father, to put your words in my mouth and that everything that comes from me would be exactly what you have purposed to be said tonight. That it would carry your heart that would reveal your character, Father. And we just thank you, Lord, in advance for all the seeds that will go out in the soil of our heart, that it would go deep, I pray, and grow roots and bear fruit in our life. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. We've been uh, apart for two weeks. So, you know, the first week we didn't have water, and the, the road was closed. And then last week was Celebration Wednesday, which was wonderful. And so we're going to recap, bring us all up to speed like we always do, and then delve into new material. So we have been in the series Prayer, a conversation, or conversations with God, learning how to convert our prayer life into a praying life in order to develop intimacy with God and to help us make this transition we have been studying the Lord's Prayer which is found in Matthew 6 9 through 13 so let's look at that really quickly I'm reading from the New American Standard Version pray then in this way our Father who is in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So, Jesus' lesson on prayer is the foundation of intimacy with God. It is a revelation of who he is. It is a guideline of the things that he wants to talk about with us when we are in conversation with him. And so far, this is what we've learned. The first thing is we've learned that he's ours, that he belongs to all of humanity, that he is available to every person. That's the revelation, is that he belongs to all people. Uh, The second is the word father. The revelation there is he is our Abba, he is our daddy, who wants to protect us and he wants to provide for us and he wants to have that intimacy of a daddy-daughter relationship. And the reason why we approach him as our father is to help us to remember of who he is and who we are. The third thing we saw is that God is holy. That's the revelation. His character is flawless and pure. And when we see the beauty of his holiness, it compels us to worship. It compels us to position our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions in a posture of worship where we are knelt before him and we are acknowledging how magnificent he is and how great he is. And we learned that worship is an expression that is lived out throughout all of our life. It is not just the musical portion of Sundays before the message is delivered, but worship is how we live our life every day, all day. And the benefit that we get from worship is one of the reasons why God continually draws us back every single day to a place of worship. It's not because he needs worship, but it's because we need worship. Because worship places him as the focal point of our thoughts. And it puts him in the right place so that we can see how big he is. And in light of his enormity, then we begin to realize, number one, how small we are. But number two, how small everything else is. 
how small our problems and difficulties and trials are in light of how big and great he is. The next thing we saw is that God is king, that he is the original source of all authority, ruling in the hearts of those who have sworn their complete allegiance to him, and their heart has become his domain. It helps us to remember that he's in control and we are not. He wants us to talk about this frequently so that we keep everything in the right perspective and know what our position is. Then we saw that God is our partner. That's the revelation, is that he is a partner. And God, he has invited us to partner with him to bring heaven to earth. When we talk with him and we ask that his will is done, we are asking him to do what he has already established in heaven and bring it down here to earth and have that manifested here. And in that, we are partnering with him. And this reminds us that he already has a perfect plan mapped out. That we don't have to come up with any solutions. That we don't have to develop a strategy that will help us get from A to B. But God already has the perfect answer waiting for us to lay hold of it in heaven. And through conversation with him, bring that answer down to earth. Then we saw that he is our nourishment, our sustenance, and our sustainer. The revelation as our bread means that he is our provider and not through physical needs, but that he himself is everything we need because Jesus is the bread of life. And as the bread, we are asking him to fill us so completely and so fully that every craving and every longing we have is completely satiated by him. And this reminds us, he wants us to talk about this very frequently because it reminds us that I don't have to look anywhere else for anything else, but that Jesus is everything I'm ever going to need. Not Jesus and, but Jesus, period. And then, before we had this little two-week hiatus, we have been unpacking verse 12. For three weeks, we have been on verse 12. This is week four. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. We've been discussing forgiveness, so it's understandable why we've been on this topic for quite some time. The first portion of this verse is forgive us our debts. Now, what do we learn about God in this? What is the revelation of God? Is that he is our forgiver. That he is a forgiving God. That he wants to forgive. That he wants to show mercy. He delights in showing mercy. And it is only God, through Jesus, who can wipe away our sin debt. There is no other way to have your sins forgiven and removed except by God through Jesus. And then the reason why he wants us to remember this so frequently is because he wants us to, to ask him to search us and know us, to try us and see if there be any wicked way in us. Look at my heart, inspect me into the deepest corners of my existence to see if there's anything in me that offends you, God. Because if there is, I want you to reveal it to me. I want you to show it to me because I don't want to go back into debt. I don't want to accrue any debt. I want to live debt-free. I want to live in the freedom that he provided for us. And then we begin to look at the second part of this verse. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And this was tough. This was tough for us because this verse, in this part of the verse, Jesus is instructing us to ask for God to forgive us of our offenses just like we have forgiven the offenses of others. We are asking him to let go of my sin the same way I let go of someone else's sin. We are asking him to deal with me the same way I deal with other people. Yeah, so that's been kind of tough. And so we begin to dig into the Word, and we looked at a lot of verses on forgiveness to see what the Bible has to say about that topic. And we found that we have been instructed to forgive like we have been forgiven. And if we do that, then we know that our debt will be forgiven the way we need it to be forgiven because we have followed the pattern of Jesus. And so this is what we found. We found that when we were forgiven, he forgave all our sins. No restrictions, no limitations, no exceptions. 
We found that he didn't punish us the way we should have been punished. That he doesn't deal harshly with us. He doesn't treat us as we deserve. In other words, he treated us with love and mercy and compassion. We saw that when he forgave us, he removed every single one of our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, and he buried those sins in the depths of the oceans. We call that the sea of forgetfulness. That's a, the human term we've addressed to that. We saw that God has chosen to forget them, not that he has amnesia, but that he was purposeful to set those sins aside and not hold them against us, not to see us in the light of our sins, or not to identify us with our sins. So once you've become saved, you're no longer Kim the liar or Kim the cheater or Kim the adulterer, but you're Kim, God's baby girl. And then we saw that God delights in showing mercy. He delights in forgiving. So God is calling us to extend the same expression of grace to everyone who has hurt us because it is the most beneficial thing that we could ever do for ourselves spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Forgiveness benefits us as a whole person. And he desires to protect us. That God's all about us. Everything that he does is about us and is for us. There's not one thing selfish about God. So when he says to us, I want you to forgive the same way I forgave, not so that it could make it hard or complicated on us, but so that we could truly experience the freedom that he desires us to have. Because he knows that if we hang on to unforgiveness, it's going to damage us. In every aspect of our being. But if we will forgive, it's going to benefit us as a whole person. You see, because this is what unforgiveness will do to you. There's not a can. There's, it's a will. Okay? It can keep you out of heaven. It will sow seeds of unforgiveness in your life. It will give Satan an advantage in your life. Uh, unforgiveness will contaminate us. It allows bitterness and resentment and anger to poison us. It imprisons and tortures us emotionally and mentally. Uh, Unforgiveness will just wreak havoc in our mind and torment us. Unforgiveness can produce mental and emotional instability and lead to serious physical health issues and trigger habits and addictions. Unforgiveness is at the root of, I would venture to say, 90% of every problem that we have in our life. Unforgiveness is at the root. If we could find out, and you can because all you have to do is ask, and he'll tell you because he wants you to be free of it, so he's not going to play hide and seek with you. You can ask him, he'll tell you. Is this problem that I can't get through? Is this thing I can't overcome? Is this sickness in my body? Is the fact that I can never find rest and peace in my soul? Are my emotions in turmoil? Is all this craziness happening to me because I've got unforgiveness somewhere? Because unforgiveness is the door that lets the enemy in. And when he comes in, what's his purpose? Steal, kill, and destroy. He's not there to play patty cake. He's not there just to hang out and see what's going on. No, you left the door open. He's going to take advantage of that, go right in and begin to work on you in a negative way. But if we will forgive like God is asking us to, instructing us to, telling us to, then we are going to experience two supernatural things, and those are very beneficial for us. The first is forgiveness will allow our wound to heal. By releasing the offense and inviting Jesus, who is our healer, into that wounded area, then true, deep, thorough healing will occur. If you let him in, he's going to heal you because he's a healer. He's the healer. When we forgive, we are giving Abba the space that is needed to completely come in and make this wounded place fresh and make it new. I mean, the Bible says about Jesus, he makes all things new. He don't put a band-aid on it. There's not a lick and a promise. It is brand new. It's brand new. The second supernatural thing that happens when we forgive is that forgiveness brings justice. When we hand over the case file to God, who is the judge of the universe, 
then he becomes our defense and he vindicates us. But he can't bring justice if we don't let him have the space to bring justice. And forgiveness is turning over that case file to him and saying, you know what, I don't have a right to judge this person and I don't have a right to seek revenge and I don't have a right to determine what's supposed to happen with this, but you do. God's the only one qualified to judge anything or to pass a verdict or sentence in any situation. And he wants to do that on your behalf, but if you don't forgive, it can't be done. So when we forgive, he steps into our circumstance and he brings justice. Now, it may not look like what you want it to look like. It may not happen when you want it to happen or the way you want it to happen. In other words, God may not come in and strike them dead or give them the worst case of poison ivy for 20 years that anybody's ever seen. He may not cause them to lose their home or lose something that's important to them. And because, you know, when we are talking about revenge, we're talking about we want to stick it to them. We want to make them suffer. We want to make them hurt the way we hurt, right? That is what we want to do. But see, God's intention is always to bring that person, the offender, into a deeper relationship with him if they're a believer or into a relationship with him if they're not. So justice may not look like you think it's going to look, but it's always good. It's always the right thing. And you can rest assured, if they never enter into a relationship with Jesus and they don't let him help them deal with what they've done to hurt you here, they will pay for that because they didn't accept payment for their sin here through Jesus. So that's our recap. So let's talk about who we should forgive. Who we should forgive. I put this particular person on the top of the list because we never talk about this person in regards to forgiveness. And that is ourself. We don't mention this when we're discussing forgiveness, but forgiving yourself is essential. And the Bible doesn't specifically talk about forgiving yourself, but it does tell us in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, we looked at this verse a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at all the verses on forgiveness. And this verse says, When you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. This verse says, If you're holding a grudge against anyone. Well, I'm an anyone. And I can be holding a grudge against myself. And to be honest, I offend me more than anybody else does. Now, I don't know if that's true for you, but I get really mad at myself about some stupid stuff I have done and said. It's about some crazy choices I made. About just being a general idiot. I've been very angry with myself. I mean, think, and, and think about why that is. Why we are, it can be a lot easier to forgive another person than it can be to forgive yourself. Because when you're looking at another person, all you see is what's right there on the surface. You saw what they did, but you don't know their motives or their intent or their purpose. You don't know the emotions that are really going on inside. And they can really tell you whatever it is they want to tell you. See, I could say something very hurtful to Bev. And then when she said, you hurt my feelings, I can say, oh, well, I didn't mean to. When in reality, I did, but dang it, she caught me. You see what I'm saying? She just is seeing the surface of that. But when I look at myself, I know my purpose. I know my intent. I know my motive. I know what my emotions were. I know what my desires were. I know if, if I went against the direction of Holy Spirit and did what I wanted to do anyway, I see the corruptness of my own actions in a way that I cannot see anybody else's. And so because of that, it's really hard for us to forgive ourselves, And we just rehash our mistakes over 
and over and over again. And we do. We relive those poor choices. We beat ourselves up for the sins that we committed. Some of us are still beating ourselves up over things that we did in our pre-Jesus life. We rehearse all the shoulda, woulda, couldas that come with the perfect vision of hindsight. We pine for the way things would be if we had only fill in the blank. If we could just go back and do it all over again. If I could just go back and say something different. If I could just go back and do something different. And we just continue to rehearse over and over and over again in our minds those conversations that we had or the choices that we made or the direction that we went in. We can look back and know that this one thing was the pivotal moment in our life that led us on this path that we're now on that we hate. And by lamenting over all of those things, we keep that offense stirred up. We keep the wound fresh. Who made the wound? I did. Me, myself, and I. I chose that all by myself. I said that. Those words came out of my mouth, out of my own free will. I made that decision. I went in that direction. I chose that course and that pattern for my life. It was me. And I just keep going back to the wound that I created and ripping off the scab and jabbing a stick in it every single time I think about all of that stuff. And I can't get past the past. But listen, if Abba can forgive me, who in the world am I to keep holding it against me? Am I saying that I'm wiser than he is? Am I saying that I know more than he does? Am I saying that there is something that he is unaware of? That he's not just? What are we saying if we will not forgive ourselves and yet God has already forgiven us? The second that you may need to forgive is not necessarily a person, but it is a situation or an entity. There are times when we've been hurt and you can't put a face to it. You know, like, for example, that business that cheated you or the company who laid us off or the government or the justice system. There's not really a name that you can associate it with it, but it's they. Well, they did this. Well, who's they? Well, you know them. Y'all know those situations. Y'all know what those are like. And just because you can't put a face to it doesn't mean you weren't hurt. Doesn't mean that there was some kind of damage that happened to you. And so you're going to need to forgive that situation, forgive that entity, that group of people who collectively made a decision that impacted your life negatively. And you don't even know who they are. The third person you're going to have to forgive is everyone whether they are living or dead if they remotely offended you they have to be forgiven nowhere in scripture if you'll remember five weeks ago when we started on this nowhere in scripture could we find any exception and that's what makes this thing so tough because some of us have had some horrible things done to us Some of us have been abused and misused and violated in ways that we can't even hardly come to terms with. Some of us have had the most vilest things said to us. But there are no exceptions in the Word of God. Whatever the offense looks like, you have to forgive the person associated with that offense. If they intentionally did it, absolutely. If they unintentionally did it, absolutely. Now, I am aware that there are some people who say that if a person has passed away, then extending forgiveness is not possible or it's not necessary or required. However, I'm going to humbly disagree with that. Because when they died, they did not take that offense with them. And when they died, they didn't erase the event or the circumstance that wounded you. Their death did not change anything. What happened still happened. 
and you're still hurt. It didn't change the view of what happened. It didn't change the repercussions of what happened. And so if you're hurt and that person is gone, then you still have to forgive them because you're still dealing with the effects and the ramifications of what their choices were and how they impacted you. They are the ones that are responsible for it. Just like when we said, you know, we have to forgive ourselves. I have to forgive me because I'm the one responsible that made this big mess. I'm the one that's responsible that hurt myself. I have to forgive me if I'm going to get free from that. And the same thing is true about a person who may have passed away. They're still responsible for what they did. And they're the only person that we can forgive. You can't forgive me because somebody else was a jerk to you, right? And how are we going to get free and unlock the prison that we're in and that we're tormented through if we don't forgive, right? Because that's what forgiveness does. According to the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 18, that's how we get out of prison is through forgiveness. Well, you can only do that by forgiving the person who hurt you. The fourth type of person that you're going to have to forgive is that person, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is that person that you gave a pass to. Well, you know, the best example I can think of is your parents. There's plenty of other people, but we'll use our parents. Bless their hearts. They always get the, the finger pointed at them. But we will say, well, yeah, I know that my parents did this, but you know they were doing the best that they could do. They did it the best they knew how. Well, I mean, my parents really, if you think about it, they were really messed up. They were broken. They were hurt. And you know the saying, hurt people hurt people. So, I mean, you really can't expect anything different. It's just kind of the way it is, and I don't want to blame them because... You know, they were doing the best they could. I can appreciate that. But the truth is, they still hurt you. Whether they meant to or whether it was perceived, you're still wounded. And just because we say we're going to forgive someone like our parents doesn't mean that you're saying they were horrible, bad people. You're just acknowledging, you know, i got a wound right here. And instead of pretending like it's not here, I want it to be cleaned up. And so I'm going to forgive them. Doesn't change the fact that I love them. In fact, forgiving them for this could really enhance my relationship with them. Doesn't mean that you have anything against them. It just means you want your wound healed. And the fifth kind of person that we're going to forgive is those people that we excused. And the best example I can think of that is kids. Well, you know, kids will be kids. Oh, kids just do crazy things. Well, they don't mean anything by it. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't understand the power of their words. And that's true. But are you still hurt? Are you still hurt? And if you are, then you have to forgive them. Because it's the only way that you're going to find healing. Another thing I want to kind of toss in here too is that time makes no difference. I remember when the Lord was helping me go through this years ago, process through forgiveness and, and get inner healing, that he brought, I kept saying, Lord, I want you to do this in my life. And I kept asking for it and asking for it and asking for it. And finally the Lord said, well, I want to do this, but I can't do this until we go back and fix this. And he pointed to something that happened to me in second grade. And I said, okay, well, Lord... Uh, does anybody even remember second grade? I hadn't thought about that in years. And the Lord said, yeah, because you swept it under the carpet. You gave those kids a pass. You excused them. Well, that's just how kids are, and that's just what kids do, and that's just the way kids work. But you're going to have to forgive this. And if you'll forgive this, I'll heal it, and I'll bring you to the place where now this that you've been asking me for can actually happen in your life. There's not a statue of limitations on forgiveness. If you hurt, if you remember it, if there's pain, then it needs to be forgiven regardless of how long ago it was. The indicators that you have not forgiven. The indicators that you have not forgiven. Do you think of the incident often? Are you still talking about it after all these years? 
Do you want other people to know what it is that they did to you? In other words, you're looking to expose them. Yeah, y'all all think that she's really nice, but let me tell you this. Do you want to make them look bad? I'll, I'll say all this again because I know you're taking notes. Do you think of the incident often? Are you still talking about it after all these years? There are some people that when I get together with them, I'm like, girl, that happened 20 years ago. 20 years ago. You haven't got over that by, by now? Do you want others to know what they did? Do you want to expose them? Okay, here's the next one. Is your identity connected to the offense? There are people who have let tragic things that have happened to them define who they are. So have you let what happened to you, that wound, define you and determine who you are? And the reason why that's important is because Abba is the only one who has the right to define you. As your creator... Only he knows who he designed you to be and what your destiny is. When you let an offense define you, then you're missing the mark. And you'll never have the fulfilled and satisfied life that he designed for you to have. And that's one of the purposes of hanging on to offense that the enemy has. He wants you to hang on to it and identify with it. Because if you identify with it, you can't identify with your father. And you'll miss who you are. Number three, when you think of the situation or the person who hurt you or you hear their name or you see them, does junk rise to the surface? Do you feel angry? Do you feel that hurt? Do you feel disgust? Do you feel a wall come up? When you see them, do you avoid them? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You're in the frozen food aisle down at the Kroger. And so-and-so comes down at the end and you are like, turn my buggy around right this second. And go down another aisle. Always peeking at the next aisle to be sure y'all aren't headed in the same direction. We've all done it. Y'all be true. We've all done it. Number four, do you have ill will toward them? Are you upset if something good happens to that person? Are you glad when something bad happens to that person? Do you feel vindicated if something bad happens to that person? If you want anything than God's best for that person, that's your indicator. Unforgiveness is still there. Number five, does the person or the incident come to mind during prayer time or worship? You haven't thought about that person, you haven't thought about that situation in however long. Three or four days, ten years. And all of a sudden, you're beginning to get into God's presence and bam... There's their name. There's the memory of what happened. That's your indicator. That's Holy Spirit saying to you, <clears throat> we need to deal with this. Do you dream about them? Do you dream about the incident? That's Holy Spirit speaking to you in the night, telling you, you've got a hidden thing in your life that we need to get out. We need to root out so that you're free. If you experience any of the things that we've just mentioned, then you don't have... You have not fully forgiven. You have not forgiven. And by not fully forgiven, I mean you're still in the process. So it's still a matter that you're going to have to discuss with Abba. And we're going to talk about that in a few more minutes. But basically, if you feel anything toward that person other than love, biblical agape, then you've got issues that you still have to work through in regards to forgiveness. And, and let me say this to you, because this is a question that I get asked frequently. Do you have to say, I forgive you face-to-face, in person? 
And so I have an answer for that. And it's, it depends. Don't you love that? Because sometimes if you go to apologize, or I'm excuse me, if you go to say I forgive you, you might create more problems than you already have. Because, for example, if they're unaware that they hurt you, and then you go to say, listen, I just want you to know I forgive you. And they're going to say, what? And then you're going to bring it up, and they're going to say, well, I didn't mean that. I think you took that all wrong. I'm not... And here we go. And now they're offended, and you've got an opportunity to be offended again. So it may not be beneficial to do that, but here's an instance where you probably do need to do it. If they said, will you forgive me, and you said no. I can't. I won't. And now, because you're an obedient daughter of Abba, and you've heard all of this teaching, you're going to choose to forgive, then you're going to need to let them know, you know, I'm sorry for withholding forgiveness from you, and I do forgive you. So ask Holy Spirit. Be Spirit-led, and, and He'll tell you how every situation needs to be handled. You know? I mean, it's like, think about the instance with your parents. And they had the best of intentions, and they loved you so much, but they messed you up. You know? And so you go to them and say, Hey, I forgive you for messing me up. That may not go so well. You probably don't need to do that, you know? Be spirit-led. Be spirit-led. And let him tell you what needs to be done. Because he will give you the perfect solution. The perfect answer to each individual question so that every relationship that you have is healthy and is strong. Okay, so how does all of this affect our praying life? What does this mean for us? Um... There's a couple of steps, that, there are six steps I have that we can do that will help us let go of the offense and process through and work through forgiveness. And, you know, by George, we're going to finish this tonight. So we're going to move fast. We won't stop to look up the verses, but please write them down and read them so that you're sure I'm telling you truth when you get home. The first step is rely on him. You cannot forgive by yourself. Because if you could, you'd already done it, right? You don't have the capacity to forgive like God has forgiven you. You cannot do this without the power of the Holy Spirit because it just doesn't come naturally to us. And we don't really know how to let an offense go. Sometimes we want to forgive, but we find our emotions keep pulling us back into the offense. And sometimes we say the words, I forgive you, because we know... It's the right thing to do, we're supposed to do it, or it's something we have to do in order to maintain the relationship that we can't get out of, like your spouse, or or your children, or your family members. But our hearts are in nowhere near agreement with our word. So here's the thing, let's just come clean. God knows the heart of every person anyway, why are we trying to keep secrets from him? Let's just put this out in the open and say, Father... I am struggling with this thing. I I don't want to. They're a jerk. They hurt me. I didn't deserve that. It's really bad, and I don't want to. Whatever it is that you're feeling about this, tell him. I'm still angry. It's too fresh. I'm afraid they're not going to get... Uh, what they deserve. I'm afraid that justice won't be served here. I'm afraid that if I let this go, it's going to be forgotten. That's a big one. If I let this go, will anybody know what really happened here? Tell him whatever it is that you think. And then, look at Philippians 2.13. It says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I love this verse. It is one of my favorite verses. And it is such a comfort to me to know that Abba is working inside of me. That he is working inside of me to change my desires and give me a heart that wants to obey him and live righteously. So I can come to him and say, Abba, I don't want to do this. 
I just don't want to do it. But I know that's what your word says. And so your word also says that you're working inside of me to change my desires. And I'm giving you permission to do that. I'm giving you permission to change my heart. I'm giving you permission to take out my I don't want to and help me plant in I'm willing to. I'm ready to. And then this verse goes on to say that he's not only is he giving you the desire, but he's giving you the power to do what pleases him. So not only is he giving you a heart that wants to quickly let go of an offense and forgive, but he's also giving you the power to live that out. Because as most of us know, some of the offenses are so deep that we, we have to have God's grace, which is his power working inside of us, enabling us not to punch somebody in the face or turn around and run out of the Kroger. We've got to have his power to give us the grace to stand in their presence and be kind. And it not be that fake stuff, but it be genuine. We've got to have his power. And then Philippians 4.13 says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. That word everything in the Greek means everything. It is completely all-inclusive. No exceptions, no limitations, no restrictions. So this, I could say this verse this way. I can forgive through Christ who is strengthening me and enabling me and empowering me to do it. There will be no excuse when we stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ and say, I just couldn't do it. That's not going to hold any water with him. The second thing that we have to do is we have to choose to forgive. Once you've asked him to give you a heart to forgive and the power to walk in forgiveness, then you're going to have to choose to live that way. Don't wait until you feel it. Because chances are you're not going to feel it. But you're going to have to step out in faith. I ask you to give me a heart for this. I ask you to give me the power to do this. I'm asking you to do your will in my heart. I've got 100% confidence that you're going to do it. I've got full faith that what I don't feel right now doesn't compare to what you're about to deposit in me and work in me. So I'm going to step out in faith on this and choose to let the offense go and choose to put this in Abba's hands and choose to, to just completely and totally forgive. We make the choice. We make the choice how we're going to interact with them. We make the choice on how we're going to treat them. We make the choice on what we're going to do with them. It's all of our choice. Which takes us to number three. Understand it can be a process. There is no magic wand. And so saying, I forgive, does not mean it's instantaneously removed from all of the emotions that were tangled up in that offense or that the event was plucked right out of your memory and you're never going to remember it again. I sure wish that is how this thing worked. But it's not. And sometimes we have to process through the stages of forgiveness. Now listen, if you stomp on my toe, uh, the process should be pretty short. You know what I'm saying? I shouldn't need six months to work through that. So let's be reasonable, okay? But at the same time, if what happened to you is unspeakable, then you're going to need to give yourself some time to process through that. And layer by layer, let Holy Spirit heal every single aspect of you. It may take you a little bit of time. Now think that that's where a lot of us get hung up. We say, I forgive, and then we still have emotions that say, Rrr. and then we think, well, I haven't forgiven, or I can't forgive, because these emotions are still here, so it's not possible. That's not true. It's a process. It's a process. It is totally possible. It's totally doable, or God would not have called us to do it. It's possible because his strength is enabling you to do it. But you're going to have to work through the process. So if you have chosen to forgive and then you still have emotions that are entangled in that, you still feel uncomfortable when you see that person, uh, the memories are still kind of plaguing you, then you're going to have to stop and remind yourself, no, no. We're not going here. Because y'all know we just did that emotion series. Your emotions will drag you down the street. 
and mess you up before you can blink an eye. And you're going to have to take control of them, pull them into custody with the power of the Holy Spirit and say, no, we're not going there. In case you forgot, we forgave. And because I chose to forgive, you're not allowed to behave this way anymore. Take authority over your emotions. And then Holy Spirit, you see what I feel. You see the things that are being replayed in my mind. You see what's going on with me right now. You see that the enemy is trying to drag me back into unforgiveness and imprison me again. Help. That's all you got to say. Help. Don't you know that your daddy is right there ready to help his baby girl? work through whatever it is that you're trying to work through? If your heart is really positioned in a place that you want to work through this, He will pour the resources of heaven right into you and give you what you've got to have. Every time those emotions surface, every time those memories come rushing in, choose to give them to Abba. Father, I don't even know what these things are doing here because I gave you the case file. Here. I don't know what to do with it, so here. There's no place for that here anymore. Because you came and healed that spot and there's no pot for them to brew in. I need you to take these. The fourth thing that we're going to do, let me say this about the process. Keep doing that until peace comes, until absolute release comes. Okay? You, you might have to do that for a while. Don't get discouraged, okay? All right, number four. Pray for them. Boy, this one is a stinker, isn't it? pray for them. The word tells us several things that we're supposed to do concerning forgiveness and forgiving our enemies and if we do this, it will speed up the process exponentially. So, praying for your enemies, praying for those who abused you, praying for those who misused you, praying for those who mistreated you. Luke 6, 27 and 28 says, But to you who are willing to listen, in other words, to you who really want to do this thing right, to those of you who have a heart to match my heart, to those of you who are really my followers, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. It is very difficult to detest or hate or loathe or despise or dislike or not love somebody that you are honestly praying for. It's hard to do. It is hard to start praying for them. I will not disagree with that. But give yourself a week or two and just see what God does. Because when you pray for them, God does this amazing work in you. More than likely, He's not doing anything like that in them. He's doing this work in you. When your prayer is, Father, bless them, and help them and provide for them and comfort them and fill their life with your presence and fill their life with blessings, Father, and be good to them and kind to them and take care of them and let them see your greatness in their life. Man, God will answer that prayer and He'll be changing your heart in the process. Now, if you're praying, get them. Just get them. Show them. Show them their faults. Show them how they're wrong. Show them how they did me wrong. Show them how they hurt me. Let them see how bad they messed me up. I'm pretty sure nothing is, nothing is happening in either one of you. <laughs> Pray for them to be blessed. And then you need to speak well of them. Romans 12, 14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them, but pray that God will bless them. In the Greek, the word bless here means to speak well of. Speak well of those who persecute you. The word to curse is to speak evil of. Don't speak evil of them. You cannot walk in forgiveness and gossip about them. You cannot walk in forgiveness and complain about them even if they remain anonymous. You can't walk in forgiveness and continue to repeat the offense and tell the story and talk about what they did and how they did it and how it's all been, you know, a bad deal for you. 
If you really want to do this, if you want healing in those wounded places, stop talking about it. Stop. Stop talking about them. Stop complaining about them. Stop alluding to it. You cannot get over it if you keep talking about the situation or the people involved. Number five, release it and let it go. Now, let it go doesn't mean, oh yeah, whatever, it's no big deal. Let it go is the intentional letting go of it in your mind. You see, too often we spend so much time turning every detail over and over in our mind and we relive the experience and we interject things that we wish we had said or we wish we had done, almost fantasizing about how the outcome could have been different if I had just done this. If I had just told somebody sooner. If I had just stood up for myself. If I just hadn't whatever. And we're kind of sick that way. It's a twisted thing we have to replay how things happened to us over and over and over again. And do not think for a second that that's not instigated by the enemy. But we let the movie show keep going over and over and over again. Whatever your thoughts are about that, stop replaying it. Stop rehearsing your regrets. Stop rehearsing what they said. Quit reliving the event regardless of of what, regardless of what happened, if you keep thinking about it, you're hanging on to the offense. You can say, I forgive you. You can pray for them. You can pray the right way for them. You can stop verbally talking about them, but if it's still going on in your mind, it's still living inside of you. And if we keep doing that, it's like peeling off the scab and preventing healing from actually taking place because when we relive the event over and over and over again in our mind, we are reviving the emotions that were ignited the first time it happened. And when those negative emotions are stirred up, healing just can't take place. So when thoughts of the person or the incident come to mind, you take that, captive, you take that thought captive in the authority of Jesus Christ. You surrender it to Him. Confirm your choice to forgive. Place that in His hands. Pray for them and then say, I'm done with this. I can't go here anymore. It's not healthy for me emotionally or mentally or spiritually or physically. I can't do this. It's not worth it. Because if replaying it over and over in your mind could fix it, it would already be fixed. If it could change the situation, it would have long since been changed. By replaying it over and over in your mind and thinking about it often, you're doing no one damage but yourself. And number six, do it immediately. Anytime you are hurt or wounded or, or you are offended in any way, immediately choose to forgive. This, what, this is what it means to walk in forgiveness. I am choosing not to pick that up. I know you said that. I know it was catty. But you know what? Not going to pick that up. I fell for that once before. Didn't do me any good. Didn't benefit me. Didn't bless me. Didn't enhance my relationship with Jesus. In fact, it caused more work for me. Because then I had to process through all of this stuff when I could have been doing something else. So I'm just not even going to pick it up. And sometimes, you know, you get slimed and you didn't even realize it. The second you do, immediately start wiping that thing off through forgiveness. Choose not to pick it up, but if it just slimes you without you even making that choice and it hits you full side, Jesus, I'm letting this go. I'm going to give this to you. Before it has a chance to grow a root and begin to poison you with anger and resentment and bitterness, how about we just kill it when it's a seed? How about we just get rid of it before it starts any damage? Now, understand that forgiveness can be a process. Forgiveness is a choice that you're going to make. Forgiveness is... See, listen, look at... 
Look at the beauty of the Lord's Prayer because this is all about a revelation of who He is and developing intimacy with Him. If this part of God's of the Lord's Prayer does not develop intimacy with God, then something is wrong because this is the opportunity for you to pour out every hurt, every wound, everything that's ever done to you and let Him into the deepest parts of your existence and allow Him to heal that so totally and completely that you're brand new. You let Him into places that people don't even know are there. You got damaged spots that your spouse doesn't know about or your parents don't know about, your best friend don't know about, your siblings don't know about. But you just let God into that. That's intimacy. And he saw you at the ugly place and he said, I love you anyway. And I'm going to heal you of this. This is a beautiful thing. Don't be afraid of forgiveness. It's going to be a little bit of work, but it's worth it. It's really worth it. Understand that forgiveness and loving the offender does not mean that you've got to be best friends with them and have them over for dinner. I want us to know that. It does not mean that you have to have a relationship with them. It does not mean that you have to trust them because they may not be trustworthy. It may mean that you have a relationship, but boundaries have to be instituted. But that doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven. I think that's one of our biggest fears is that if I forgive them, then that means I have to spend time with them. And No, it doesn't. It, they, they might, which is why I said some people aren't trustworthy. They might, which is why I said some people need boundaries. And be spirit-led in that. He'll teach you. If you want me to teach you how to set up boundaries, you're looking at the wrong person. Because each individual relationship and situation is different and Holy Spirit knows exactly what boundaries need to be set for all the relationships in your life let him teach you how to do that so when you truly forgive you're no longer going to hold something against that person you're not going to repeatedly bring it up to them you're not going to drag that thing out the next time you have words now get that because a lot of times we girls are guilty of that. We'll say we forgive, and then, you know, because of the way our brains are connected, everything is connected to everything. Everything, you know, all roads lead to everything in our brain. <laughs> and so, here, we'll use our husband as, a, as an example because those work pretty well. And so, our husband says this. And so we're saying, I can't believe you said that. That's just like six months ago when you said blah, 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 blah. Well, those two things technically are not even related, but in our head they're related. And we said we forgave them, but now we're just pulling that thing right back out. Then you didn't forgive. If you forgave, it's dead, it's gone, it doesn't exist. If you forgave, it is not allowed to bring back into the present. Unless you really want a big, nasty fight on your hands. When you truly forgive, you don't bring the subject up to other people. You don't think about it. The incident will fade from your memory. And if you do think about it, the sting is not going to be there. The uncomfortableness, the wall that you would throw up, all of those things are going to go away. It's a process. It may take time, but it'll happen. Let me make this other side note. If you are in a situation with a repeat offender, somebody that you cannot remove from your life, then you've got to be completely spirit-led. Because there are people in our lives that continue to hurt us by the things that they say or the things that they do, but, you know, they're a permanent fixture. And so be spirit-led with that. If a conversation needs to be had, then he'll tell you when to have it and what to say. Don't come at it with your own reasoning because you'll make a mess out of it. He will teach you how to deal with that repeat offender. I have encouraged you to go home and make a list. Write down those offenses you still feel. Those places where you're still hurting, where you've got anger or bitterness or resentment where you've got that grudge, where the wall has been thrown up. 
Write down the person. And don't just say so-and-so is a jerk, but say so-and-so said this. So-and-so did this. So I, I hope that you've made your list. I want you to go home and work through your list and pr- by praying through this prayer. There's some blanks in here. Abba, I choose to forgive so-and-so. I forgive them for saying unkind words to me, not respecting me, and starting rumors. See how you fill in the blanks there. I see the debt that I believe they owed me, which was to respect me, which was to be my friend and protect me. And before you, Abba, I release them from this debt. Abba, I release them to you because you're the only one who has the right and the authority to hold them accountable for what they did and deal with them as you see fit. And so, Abba, I ask you to heal my wounded heart and my bruised emotions so that I can love them and all the other people in my life. Dismantle the prison that I built for myself because of unforgiveness and bitterness towards them. Tear down this prison so that I'm totally free and will no longer shut people out of my life due to unforgiveness. And please bring peace to my heart so that whenever I remember what they did or when I am in their presence that I will be filled with your peace and your love. This is a beautiful prayer. I keep a copy of this tucked away in my nightstand because I'm not dead and I don't live on this planet alone. And chances are, somebody is going to hurt me, whether they meant to or not. And when they do, I run to my nightstand, I whip out this piece of paper, I get on my knees, and me and Jesus process through this thing. If I have a dream about somebody, if somebody comes to mind in worship, if the Holy Spirit drops something in my heart during prayer time, I go whip this thing out, and I pray through it. And there are times when I'm thinking, you know, I really don't think I have an issue with anybody. I think I'm doing pretty good. Holy Spirit say, listen, back in 1994, (laughs) you hadn't been ready to deal with this until now, but now you are. So let's pull this out. Let's work through this. I'll go get my little sheet of paper. I will get on my knees and I will start to pray. And you'll be amazed at what God does when you invite him in. It's crazy. It's crazy. He will do for you in just a few moments what a lifetime of counseling could ever do for you. And it's free. But definitely, if you are aware that you hurt somebody, you've got to apologize. You cannot... Listen to me. This is really important. The Holy Spirit just brought this to my memory. You cannot just start being nice and pretend it didn't happen. Because when you do that, you have not given the person that you hurt the freedom to process through that. Being nice to somebody when you have hurt them does not make it right. When you know you hurt them, when you know you said things to them, when you know they tr- you treated them a certain way, when you know you said things that got back to them, Being nice doesn't fix it. An apology fixes it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. we got to grasp that. Now, if they don't know, let's not stir up any trouble. But if they know that you said what you said and you did what you did, if they know the motives of your heart and the intentions of your heart, don't make nice, make it right. Let me pray. Father... Thank you so much for loving us enough to require us to forgive. Thank you for all the gifts and the supernatural things that you bring to us when we forgive. Thank you it's not just a wasted or futile exercise, but in that you do things in us that could never be accomplished another way. And we are so grateful because you are bringing to us a wholeness that we could never experience outside of you. So Father, we give you permission to bring to our heart and our mind every offense that we're hanging on to. Every wound that we have not allowed to heal. 
We give you permission to convict us when we are speaking negatively about the person that hurt us or we are rehashing what happened to us or we are replaying in our mind the event. And give us the strength. We're going to stand on your promise when you said that you would change our hearts so that it matches yours. And that you would give us the power to live that out. We invite you in and give you permission to do that because we cannot do this any other way. Holy Spirit, lead us to know when we need to confront somebody and how to set up uh, boundaries and, and, and how to let someone back into our life even though they may not be totally trustworthy. Teach us what all that looks like. Teach us when we need to actually approach someone and say, I forgive you, or when it's a matter between you and I. Teach us, Lord, what it looks like to go back and genuinely apologize and make right a wrong that we have committed. Because, Lord, we want to know you and we don't want anything to block that. Anything to hinder us from having intimacy with you. Father, you see the life of every woman here and what they need. And I ask you on their behalf to meet those needs. And we thank you, Father, for your goodness and kindness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.